our topic today is marriage. I've been on this for a while. Uh, if you want to see the full, these are just summaries of, I've got about nine or ten lessons, I think, on alrosenbloom.com. If you want to go there and see, hear the, all the lessons. But uh, just a couple of things before we actually get into this. I see two, you know, on, on Saturdays, second four Saturday, Ron's teaching a class called Teleology. It's called, the, he's talking about reaching maturity and the different stages along the way. And so you can see the Christian life broken down in many different ways, but one of the ways that I see it in my own life is that for the longest time, my life with God was about getting God to help me with my human agenda. Make this work for me and make that work for me. Open this door so I can have, you know, prosperity or we can have enough of this or more of that or less of this. And anyway, it was about God getting into my human agenda. And one day I began to realize, and I got older and more mature, I realized that it was really more about me getting involved in God's agenda. And that was a switchover for me. And when that began to happen, and I began to accept that, lay aside my own human agenda and accept his agenda, that's when I began to see this Romans 8, 28 we talked about, that even though it wasn't humanly good for me today, in the divine scheme of things, it was God producing good through my life. And that was really more important. Uh, another thing that I want to introduce with is the the tendency that we have is very dangerous. It's reading our human experience into the Bible. For instance, I grew up in a home with a very strong father and a very, I won't say weak, but a, a, a very agreeable mother with him. So she was kind of meek and mild, and he, he was very gentle, but he was very firm. And, you know, it was a good environment to grow up in. And later on when I got saved, I was taught by someone who had a very similar type of marriage, very strong personality, you know, and a wife that was, you know, more moderate and, and agreeable. And so, of course, when I decided to get married, I married a woman that was a wallflower that never had any opinions or anything to say. <laughs> she is very strong and very wonderful. Very wonderful. So, the point I've learned, see, I, I was taught, or at least I, learned, I, I, I heard, that the man's supposed to be in charge. He's the boss. He's going to be the boss. And that didn't serve me very well in my marriage. I think a lot of men have gotten that idea and misunderstood how this really works. I think it's caused a lot of conflict in many Christian marriages. Because men tend to think, I was taught by this person who had this kind of marriage, and it was basically personalities. It wasn't God, it was personalities, that I was responsible for everything. I'm responsible for my wife's choices. I'm responsible. So if I'm responsible, then I, I should be able to control it. And it don't work like that. <laughs> Bible doesn't teach it that way. So I'm going to try to I'm going to try to share with you my present view of it as I continue to grow. So, marriage, my title is Using Conflict to Develop Compatibility. Christian marriage is a, uh, a mutually edifying relational system. You've got to stop thinking about being afraid of conflict. Conflict in your life, I mean, without raising your hand, who's afraid of conflict? Who avoids it like the plague? Listen, you are missing so many opportunities to grow, to help, to serve, to tell the truth. You know what people need? They need you to love them and care about them, but they need the truth. Most of us want to live in a la-la land and pretend that things are better than they are or they're worse than they are. They need truth. So. Adversity and conflict are opportunities, first of all, to recognize your own selfishness. I mean, are you selfish in your marriage, in your relationships? Is it about you? You always first? It's a chance to change when you see that. 
It's, a chance, it's an opportunity to see the personal differences between you for compromise. It's a chance to apply, to apply divine promises and principles for your growth in God's glory. And fourthly, it's a chance, an opportunity to further habituate new man beliefs and behaviors. Conflict and adversity, these are opportunities to see yourself, to see the other person. See, you don't really know what the other person thinks until the conflict comes. And then you realize, wow, I didn't know that was so important to you. I didn't know you felt that way. Well, let's find a way to work that out. So it works for both of us. That's how you handle most issues in marriage. See, it's compromise. So you get a chance to apply the word of God to your situation, to yourself, to the other person. And you get a chance to form habits with that person. That person is your training partner. You form habits that are of doing the right thing, of believing and thinking and feeling and doing the right thing. So, submission, just review. Christian wives are commanded to submit to their husbands. That's Colossians 3.18. It's the only place that I can find where the word submission to the wife is a command. Every other place, it's a participle, meaning it's not the main idea in the sentence. It's an accompanying idea. By allowing their believing husband, this is for believing husbands, to influence them in their growth in the Lord. Developing practical sanctification. Now, I'm going to get to the husband today, and I know that my wife is very glad because I've been on the wife for about ever, forever. But, and the reason is I didn't understand it. I could not understand why a woman was supposed to be submissive. It's to form a visual aid. Colossians 3.18 is the only passage I can find where the wife's submissive role is expressed as a command. But in Ephesians chapter 5, maybe you should go there because I don't, I don't have it on the right. Go to, go to Ephesians 5 real quick. I, I had it written down for us, but... Huh? Now I'm wanting verse 20 through 24. So if you go back to verse 18, Ephesians 5, 18, which should be very familiar to you. This is the passage. It says, so, so then do not be foolish, but understand the will of God. That's 17. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is addict addictive, but be filled with the Spirit. All right? And that fill with the Spirit is a command. Yesterday we dealt with it in Greek class and somebody said, well, wait a minute. You have to get the wife drunk to get her to submit. And uh, <laughs> I thought, well, that's one way. Uh, that's one way. What you have after that is five participles that go along with being filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, these things are accompanying, as a rule, speaking to one another in spiritual words, spiritual ideas. Singing and, so and singing the psalms with one another. This is worship service. Being grateful to the Lord for everything. And then finally, he says, submitting to one another, which is the idea of being open to the influence of other believers. Somebody has the gift of encouragement, and they come to minister to you. Somebody has the gift of mercy, they come to minister. Somebody has the gift of giving, and they come share with you. You're open to be influenced by others. That verb in verse 21, be submissive to one another, if you look at that, is transferred. That verb is transferred to the wife in verse 22. He says, be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, the verb in verse 21 is transferred down to verse 20. There is no verb. In other words, the way the wife's submission to the husband is, is allowing him to influence her like another believer in the congregation would minister to her. She's to be open to his leadership in the spiritual life because that's his role. Listen to this. He says, for the husband's the head, 
is Christ is the head, being the Savior of the body. See, Christ is the Savior, not the husband. But as the church is submissive to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church, sacrificed himself for her. That he, and, and here's the purpose. See, here's, the, here's how Christ loves the church. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church so that he might sanctify her. This is practical, experiential sanctification on the husband's part having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present her to himself, the church, in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless at the judgment seat of Christ. So the Christ is working in the life of the wife or the church to bring us to spiritual maturity, that we might stand before him at the evaluation seat and be holy and blameless. The husband is to love his wife in that same way. His job is to, is to strive to foster her spiritual growth. Every decision he makes is about will this help her? Will this benefit her in the spiritual life? That's his job, is to help her grow spiritually. Because listen, the only thing at the judgment seat of Christ that's going to count is what is produced through the ministry of the Spirit and the truth of the Word of God because you love the Lord. You, you following some human, see, if the husband can persuade the wife through his personality or his whatever, then she submits or gives in or complies because of him, she's not doing it for the Lord. Guess what? She's not going to, that's not divine good. That's not, in the sense, her motive is for him, not for the Lord. I personally believe that what's going what's to last is what's done for the Lord. So, guys, you could talk her into doing what you want, perhaps, but how's that going to help her? How's that going to help her in the, with the Lord? How's that going to help her spiritually? It's not. No, so the second submissive was 1 Peter 3, and turn over to 1 Peter 3 right quick. We, we've got a second. So, the book of 1 Peter has five different places where Peter uses the word submit, hupotasso. This is submission to government, um, this is submission of slaves to masters. It was Christ submitting to his father to go to the cross. He's talking about people, believers in under unjust suffering, in difficult situations, adversity. What, is their, what are they supposed to do? Submit to the Lord, to, for the government, for your employer, for, you know, if they're going to execute you. Like Christ. Of course, if you're paying for the sins of the world, then you can just go ahead and give in to that. But I don't think you are. But anyway, in verse chapter 3, verse 1, he says, in the same way. What is he saying? He's saying, just like Christ surrendered to his father, just like the slave is to submit to the master, just like you're to obey the government, the laws of the land, wives, be submissive. And that's hupotasso. To, but listen, to your own husband, why? So that even if they are disobedient or unpersuaded by the word, they might be won over. And that's the word Paul uses for winning people to Christ. They may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Now, ladies, what is the chance if you're married to a man who's not listening to the word of God, that you're going to try to win him back to the Lord without words. No? Yes? <laughs> well, it's, it's the woman's inner peace. He goes on and talks about the woman's inner tranquility because she trusts the Lord. Whatever the husband does, she says, I've got the Lord. I'm at peace. Do what you're going to do, dude. I know you're not walking with God, 
Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're saved and not walking with God. Your attitude is wrong. What you're saying, I don't agree with, but I trust the Lord. And because of that, I'm at peace. And that peacefulness, that inner tranquility from her faith, Peter says, is a ministry that reveals the Lord to that man. Not words, but that inner peace. Her tranquility because she trusts God is a ministry to him. In the first passage, he's ministering to her spiritual growth. In the second passage, she's ministering to his. It's a mutually edifying system. It's designed to mutually edify. And in my opinion, because I don't see this anywhere in here, it's not about everyday life submitting to the dictates of a human being, another ma a man, that, that the wife's supposed to do whatever the husband says. You know, no, we're not going to paint the house that color. We're going to paint it this color. No, we're not going to spend this much on groceries. We're going to spend this much. I think that's negotiated stuff because it's about spiritual life. So let's talk about the husband. First of all, Ephesians 5, 25 through 29. Husbands, love your wife, your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, and that he might present to himself, this is the judgment seat of Christ, during the tribulation, the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So, first of all, what is agape love? Let's see if we can understand that. Now, agape love, we, many people think of it as, as God's love or Christian love. But listen, before the word agapao or agape was used to designate God's love or our love for one another, it was a secular word. Okay, It was used in the Greek uh, everyday life. Agape love was a commonly, commonly used secular Greek word used to indicate a high-level commitment and dedication to someone or some desired aspect of life. It's a high-level commitment. All right, I'm going to show it to you. The Pharisees, Luke 11:43. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love, there's our word, same word is used for God's love. You love the front seats in the synagogue. And you are, you are committed, your life is committed to having those front seats. You're willing to do whatever to be in that position. You'll sell out Christ. You'll sell out your mother. You know, they used to take the old people and, and use the law to steal their homes. Uh, so... You love these front seats. You love the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Listen to John 12. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, in Christ. They believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not acknowledging that. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they loved Agapao, the approval of men rather than the approval of God. The Pharisees and rulers were so committed and dedicated, agapao, that means you're dedicated to something, to having the places of honor and the approval of their peers. That even knowing he was Messiah, they refused to acknowledge him. So why? Because they loved this prominence they had. They loved the prosperity where they loved the respect they loved the praise they loved it they were committed to it they wanted it they were dedicated to having it that's what their life was about you know uh years ago when i was still physically able i love i agapaoed golf 
I mean, I'll, I'll, I ate it, drank it, slept it, played it, spent all my money on it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I loved it. That's agapao. I was committed to it. I practiced it. I thought about it every day, found opportunities to do it. I loved it. All right. So what, it is, what is it that you are committed to in your life? What do you love? See, that's agapao. Now, when you apply it to God, in John 3.16, agape love uh, describes the total commitment of God to offer salvation to the human race, even though it meant sacrificing his son. See, God wasn't all emotional about us. God was committed. He's committed to you. When he gave you this promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will provide all of your needs. Those are commitment words. That's a promise. That's a vow. That's a commitment. John 3, 16, For God so loved, agapao, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's verse 16. Three verses later, he says, This is the judgment, that light has come into the world through Jesus Christ. But... Men loved darkness. Guess what word? They're committed to their evil way of life. Light comes with the truth. You've got to change your mind about what the Messiah, who he's going to be, what he's going to be like, and you've got to believe that he's going to pay for your sins and rise from the dead. They preferred their evil way of life. I mean, who do you know that prefers their sinful, distracted lifestyle rather than coming back to the Lord? They love that. That's agapao. So, God was committed to sacrifice his son to save whosoever would believe. In the same way, mankind was committed to hanging on to their evil beliefs and lifestyles. Many people like that. Many people won't come to church because they, they don't want to give up their sins. They think they have to give up their sins to come to church. But coming to church is, is uh, showing yourself or something. It's where, you go, it's where you go to learn, to grow, and, get, and gain the ability to give up your sins. All right. So agape love is the mindset. You know what a mindset is? You set your mind and you're committed to it. It's the mindset of commitment and dedication of your entire being that God wants from us. Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord your God, that's agapao, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Totally dedicate and commit your entire self to the Lord. That's agapao. So when it gets to husbands loving their wife, your life is dedicated to benefiting her. Your command is to dedicate your mind, your heart, your soul, your love, your emotions, your behaviors to benefit her in the Lord. That's your job. There is no other job. And you say, well, what about me? You get it from the Lord. You get it from the Lord. And that's how this works. You go, well, who can do that? You got to grow. And your marriage will be the very crucible. It will be the mirror that shows you where you're not measuring up. Every time you fail, every time you lose your temper and you become selfish and, you know, you criticize instead of nurture. What does that show you? That needs to go. Whatever was the root of that anger or that disappointment or that frustration or that behavior, that needs to be rooted out of my soul and discarded and replaced with the truth of God. I think that's mainly what marriage is for, to reveal that to you so you can grow. And there's some nice perks to it as well. So... 
Agape love is defined as a mindset of total unconditional commitment and dedication to do no harm to others and only benefit and edify them, regardless of circumstances or response given. In, 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 with, with every one of you here, I've had that mindset for years. I try not to ever do any harm to you. I'm not a perfect person. I'm not really that nice of a person. Am I wrong? <laughs> I mean, maybe I am, but I love you, but I don't necessarily am not this sweet, gooey person. But, but let me tell you what I am. I'm, I'm, I'm yours. You have me. I will give you everything that I have as far as spiritually. I will give it all to you. Anytime, anywhere you need it. That's the mindset. That's agape. So, it's, 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 it's unconditional. You say, well, I don't want it from you. I don't want anything from you. Okay. When you do, if you do. Well, I don't like what you said. Well, I'll do it again. Say it again. I'm not afraid to tell the truth. So secondly, Christian husbands, unconditionally commit yourself to do no harm to your wife. Your frustration, your anger, your bitterness. Colossians 3.18, husbands love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Do not be bitter toward them. You got to get rid of that bitterness. So you commit yourself to do no harm to your wife and dedicate your life to strive for her edification, her spiritual growth in the Lord as Christ does for you. He is totally committed to you 24-7 for you to grow, for you to come into this experience of loving him. That's the husband with it to his wife. When it says like Christ loves the church, what does that mean? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so he can present her to himself with no spot or wrinkle but holy and blameless. Christ strives to encourage our spiritual growth to produce maturity, which is what we call practical or experiential sanctification, in this life and permanent sanctification at the judgment seat. I want you to notice something also that growing into maturity is described as a cleansing. That's very important. It's a cleansing. Your growth is a cleansing from the old in an embracing of the new. So, a husband is a shepherd. Husband's a shepherd. Whose commitment to his own growth in the Lord, who is committed for that and to strive for the benefit of his wife, giving her spiritual leadership and an example. The husband is never addressed about authority in the marriage. He is, he is told that he is the head. He is the head. But the issue of authority or submission is only addressed to the wife. He is never told to be in charge, to be the boss, or control his wife. He is to shepherd her in love. So, when Christian husbands participate in this visual aid of Christ in the church by nourishing and protecting their wives like they care for their own bodies. See, this is the visual aid. is Christ caring for the church. Husband caring, Christian husband Caring for the wife. This word nourish means the, like this is to give provision for growth, like a child. Now, she's not a child, hopefully. You say, well, maybe she is, but help her grow. You, it's, a, it's a providing of nurturing for growth. And the word cherish means to provide warmth, comfort, or encouragement. The husband is the nurturer. We think of the wife as the nurturer. The husband is the nurturer. He's to nurture her. Now listen, this is walking all over me. Thirdly, the entire Christian marriage system only works to please God now. I know I've talked to hundreds of marriages, hundreds of them as a counselor. And I've, taught, I've seen many of them that seem to work and get, they, get, they figured out how to get along. That was by the wife being in charge of everything. 
the guy just went, I just stay out of the way. I just stay out of the way. I'm like, you, you, is that the model you think the Lord wants? Well, we don't know. It just works for us. It keeps us from fighting. Well, that's called surrender. That's surrender. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this only works to please the Lord when both husband and wife are living their lives filled with the Spirit. See, that's back to verse 18. And they're growing in grace. This only works when you're walking in the Spirit instead of in the flesh, living out of your old man anger and greed and selfishness. That's just a recipe for chaos. Fighting all the time. So, the marriage and family discussion in Ephesians 5 follows this command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, from Ephesians 4.25, on back another chapter, to the end of the book is a series of commands. I think there's 30 or 31 imperatives. It's where Paul gets to the part about, here's how you live it. And he gives you this command. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. You know, walk in the spirit. Don't walk in the flesh. On and on. Husband, love your wife. And don't be bitter toward her. He, he, he does that, follows that all the way to the end of the book where he gets into this summary of the angelic conflict. Finally, husbands must pursue a general understanding. If you're, are you still in 1 Peter 3? <clears throat> if you'll turn back to 1 Peter 3. This is a really important passage. Peter deals with the wife in six verses. In the same way, wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wife, by the behavior of the wife. Sister, it's your behavior, not your confrontational words. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, and that means, that means, that's your, your respect, your respect, your, see, this is submission to God. All submission is to God. All submission is to God. The husband submits to God by loving his wife like Christ loved the church. The wife submits to God by submitting to the husband. And this respectful behavior, this, this word chaste means spiritual. And respectful behavior. And let not your adornment be merely external braiding the hair, wearing gold and jewelry, and in other words, emphasizing outer beauty. Instead, let it be the inner beauty of the person, the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and tranquil spirit, which is precious in the sight of the Lord. See, that's that inner spirit of tranquility from trusting him, confidently depending and leaning on him, and not a human man, is the, is the miracle that he sees in her that brings him to the Lord. So, he said, For in the same way, in the former times, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And that's a very strong statement. Fear, fear. I recently learned that in women's brains that there's more blood flow in a woman's brain to the area of the brain that creates fear. Women are t typically more fearful than men. There's more, it's not that the brains are different, it's just more blood flow in this. Women suffer with anxiety more than men. They're worried about many more things. And it's fear often that keeps a woman from being able to trust the Lord and relax and, and, and not confront the husband with, with words and, you know, all this, creating problems. So that's Sarah. Now, husbands, see, you husbands likewise. See, we're back to this whole thing of submitting. You husbands likewise... 
Live with your wife according to knowledge. It says in an understanding way. As with a weaker vessel, <clears throat> because she's a woman. Grant her honor. Assign her value. She's highly valuable as a, as a co-heir of the of a equal in Christ of the grace and lo- grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So the woman is a weaker vessel. You know what a vessel is? It's a body. He calls the vessel the body. So the woman has a weaker body. And I don't think that means strength wise, physical strength wise. I think it has to do with her cycles. I think it has to do with hormones because women are always changing and they have to deal with that. And I mean, I've had two daughters. I, I lived with four women at one time. <laughs> three of them were, three of them that were entering into that whole deal, and one of them was working their way out of that whole deal. And and there was just a lot of estrogen and hormones running through the house, and so I started naming the different hormones that were running through the house and. And look, it's just a fact. It's, it's not disrespectful to women. It's just a fact. And my sweet wife, early in, I said, you know, some days you seem to like me better than other days. You, you, one day you want to hold my hand and sit next to me. A few days later, you don't, you don't want anything to do with me. And then the next week, I might as well go fishing. She said, come here. Sat down at the kitchen table, she got the calendar out. (laughs) She did. She got the calendar out. And she said, this is how it works. You know, here, my body's doing this, and I'm really uh, agreeable. Over here, my body's doing something else, and I'm not agreeable at all. And in this week, everything's magnified. And I thought, thank you, Lord, for... (laughs) understanding that so that I can anticipate it now. I mean, the girls, they, I mean, they're so sweet some days, mostly when they're sleeping, but, uh, uh, but then other days you just don't talk to them. So anyway, though, this is the weaker vessel idea cycles that constantly or consistently cause her to be in a state of change. The word honor means, is to me, it means to, sign, to assign a high value, to consider her of great value. And finally, he calls her a co-heir of the grace of life. She is equal to him in Christ. The only deal in Christian marriage is about creating this visual aid of Christ in the church. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one or the same in Christ. So, I hope that's helpful to you. Gentlemen, nurture your wives up in the Lord. Be an example for her to look to. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm just grateful that you've opened up the scriptures for my heart to see these things. I pray that this helpful to those that are hearing and listening, that our marriages might be stronger. They might be more loving with one another and have greater impact on our own children and on, on the people in our church and beyond, that our marriages would be a, a, a neon sign of Christ in the church. The people would look into our lives and see there's more there than just the human agenda that there's a divine force at work within us and that 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 force will go out, Father, in this community and and attract many people into here that we might serve them. We love you, Father. We praise you now in Christ's name. Amen.